Arlington National Cemetery, Washington, and the final resting place of one of America's greatest heroes. Each year, three and a half million people pay homage at this shrine to the memory of President John F. Kennedy. They also come to ponder one of the greatest murder mysteries of all time. There was a monstrous cover-up of everything. I know it, and so, so do the people who covered it up. It angers me terribly that we don't know the truth. And the arrogance of those in power that continue the cover-up and the lie is beyond tolerance. We're not a free country anymore, because the people who are smart enough and powerful enough to take out a president like that and get away with it for 25 years are probably involved in other areas of the government. In other words, the country is being run by people we did not vote for. If it could be done to John F. Kennedy in 1963, it could be done to another president in the future. And we can't afford to have coup d'etats in America, no matter how cleverly orchestrated and sinister, sinisterly contrived they may be. That cannot be permitted to happen. And the way in which you prevent that from happening is to expose those elements of government and society in this country that were responsible for the killing of John F. Kennedy. The southeast corner window of the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository, Dallas. According to the official verdict, the spot where a lone gunman, Lee Harvey Oswald, fired three shots into Dealey Plaza, striking the president from behind as he rode in a motorcade down the center of Elm Street. And each year on November the 22nd, an informal gathering on the grassy knoll of people skeptical of their government's conclusion. And in honor of the events that took place here in November 1963. One moment, please. Until now, the world has been asked to accept the Warren Commission's verdict on the death of John F. Kennedy. New evidence that exposes the complex and sinister forces that brutally murdered the President of the United States 25 years ago will be shown here for the first time. President Kennedy's last day began at a Chamber of Commerce breakfast in Fort Worth. In his entourage were Vice President Lyndon Johnson and the Governor of Texas, John Connolly. Basically, his purpose for his visit to Texas, it was not just to Dallas, was to raise money for himself and for the Democratic Party, uh, and also to enhance his standing, uh, because he was looking forward to the election in 1964. I couldn't let you leave Fort Worth without providing you with some protection against the rain. I'll put it on in the uh, White House on Monday. If you'll come up there, you'll have a chance to see it there. His second engagement of the day was a luncheon in Dallas, a six-minute flight away on Air Force One. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace both now and forever. Amen. From the dark, uh, overcast, the drizzling rain of Fort Worth to the bright sunshine when we landed uh, at Love Field in Dallas, uh, it promised to be uh, an absolutely spectacular day for the president, uh, for the vice president, for me, I was governor of the state. Uh, Ms. Connolly and I rode in the car uh, with the president and Mrs. Kennedy. He got a very, very warm reception. Schools had turned out, the school children uh, were lining the street uh, by the thousands. They were applauding, and it was a very happy, uh, joyful occasion, really. Two cars back from the presidential limousine was Senator Ralph Yarborough with Lyndon and Lady Bird Johnson. As we approached the city and then finally turned down Main Street toward the Trinity River, the crowd increased as we got to the heart of uh, Dallas. It was one of the most enthusiastic crowds I saw in any city we were in, in Texas, on that tour. That's on the sidewalks. Now, if you looked up in the upper stories, I never saw a single smile in any window I looked at. Some looked down, 
and looked like with uh, dislike on the faces. Nellie turned to the president and said, now, Mr. President, you can't say now that they don't love you here in Dallas. And uh, within a matter of a few seconds after that, we turned uh, on Elm Street to go down to get on the uh, Stimmons Freeway to go out to the, uh, the trademark uh, where the luncheon was being held. And that's when uh, uh, the shots occurred. Um, I heard uh, what I thought was a rifle shot. Uh, I immediately reacted by turning to look over my right shoulder because that's where the sound came from. I didn't see anything out of the ordinary and was in the process of turning to look over my left shoulder when I felt a blow in the middle of my back as if someone had hit me with a doubled up fist about like that. The blow was of, uh, of such force that it bent me over and I immediately saw that I was uh, covered with blood and I knew I'd been hit and I said oh my god they're gonna kill us all and I heard uh, another shot that uh, was a loud shot almost like that and immediately I saw blood and brain tissue all over the back of the limousine. I knew then that uh, the president had been fatally hit because Miss Kennedy then, I heard her say, uh, my God, I've got his brains in my hand. The Secret Service in the car in front of us kind of casually looked around, looked up at the back of them and rather slow to react. And it went under the underpass and as we came up on the other side, I could see then the president's car and there was Hill, whom I knew as a Secret Service man assigned to protect Mrs. Kennedy. He was lying across the back to hang on with arm over in there so he could hang on at that high speed. His face turned back towards us, just rather than ang agony and beating with his hand on there like uh, a terrible thing has happened. I knew then that Kennedy had been shot. And within several minutes, we came to Parkland Hospital and the Secret Service immediately jumped out the minute Johnson's dad said, they practically pulled him out and formed a cordon around him. Four or five and one of them said, Mr. Preston. I knew then Kennedy was dead. And I walked up to the car where Mrs. Kennedy was still there on the back seat lying there with her head bowed over covering the husband's head his blood running down her leg and by on her clothes and twice saying they've murdered my husband they've murdered my husband it's the most tragic sight of my life while the senator wept for his president inside parkland hospital doctors battled to resuscitate him in trauma room one my most vivid impression of the entire agitated scene was that his head had been almost destroyed. Uh, the face was intact but very swollen and it was obvious that he had had a massive wound to his head. We decided uh, that uh, the president was dead and uh, Dr. Clark, the chairman of neurosurgery, had come in in the meantime and he had walked up to the head of the patient and looked inside at the wound and shook his head. John F. Kennedy died at approximately 1 o'clock Central Standard Time today here in Dallas. He died of a gunshot wound in the brain. Dr. Berkeley told me it's a, it's a, a simple matter, Tom, of, uh, of a bullet right through the head. On duty at Parkland throughout these events was Aubrey Wright, an ambulance driver for the O'Neill Funeral Home. He was approached by the Secret Service. They told us to go into the trauma room and prepare the president to be moved. And had his head wrapped in in sheets. Uh, I was, you know, at the time, didn't know where he had been shot or or what, you know. And we was all very sad, you know. Everybody's choking back tears. You know, that, that, uh, but. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Earl Rose was a forensic pathologist, well-trained in medical legal autopsies, and he appeared at Trauma 1 and said, this is a homicide in Dallas County and I will do the autopsy on President Kennedy. 
In the meantime, a casket had been acquired and the president's body had been placed in it. And he was informed by the Secret Service that if he didn't get out of the way, he would be run over by the casket as they were leaving. This was the president of the United States, and they were taking him back to Washington. Well, there was a lot of uh, cursing going on. I, I was embarrassed, for, especially for Miss Kennedy, because she was standing right behind us. The priest was there. Uh, a lot of what I thought was, you know, was too foul of a language to be going on. But, you know, it was a terrifying type thing. I mean, it's hard to believe, you know, that grown people could could be so childish about things and, and everyone trying to take over. Vice President Johnson had already left for the airport, shortly to be followed by Jackie Kennedy with her husband's body. The casket was manhandled up the steps of Air Force One. Minutes later, Johnson was sworn in as the new president. Barely three hours after arriving in Dallas, the plane left for Washington. In Dealey Plaza, in the chaos immediately after the shooting, there'd been confusion about where the shots had come from. Over 50 known eyewitnesses believed that there was a gunman up on the grassy knoll, but the police quickly focused their attention on the book depository. The police were in the building within 90 seconds. In the southeast corner of the sixth floor, three spent cartridges were found lying closely together against the wall, near a half-open window that overlooked the motorcade route. Later, a rifle was found on the same floor by Deputy Sheriff Eugene Boone. In the far corner of the stairwell, you could not see this corner of the building at all from the stairwell. Uh, that's where I found the rifle over in the northwest corner of the building. There were two rows of books. The, uh, outside row was two cases high and as I looked uh, in the crevice I saw the rifle in there. It was an Italian Manica Cacano of World War II vintage, worn and rusty and with a misaligned scope. Despite intense efforts over a three-day period, the Dallas police and the FBI were only able to find Oswald's smudged palm print on the rifle after his death. Forty-five minutes after the assassination, a police patrolman, J.D. Tippett, was shot dead in the Oak Cliff area of Dallas, three miles from downtown. Squad cars swiftly converged on the Texas theater, a mile from the scene of the shooting. A man, behaving suspiciously, had slipped inside without paying and disappeared into the upper balcony. One of the first police officers on the scene was Paul Bentley. I came down from the balcony and entered the theater from this door right here. Oswald was sitting in this chair, and just as I entered, he jumped up as McDonald came up in front of him, Officer McDonald. He immediately pulled a gun from his waist. As I saw him pull the pistol, I dove over the seats and struggled, came down on the side of Oswald, or the suspect, struggling with him. I scraped his forehead with the bottom of this ring. I had some of the the skin from his forehead under the ring when I got to the city hall. I didn't shoot him because uh, at that time other officers had converged and I was afraid if, uh, if I did miss I might hit another officer. And it seemed like a hundred years before I could get that gun out of his hand and, and get it into my belt. And then after I got the pistol away from him, I let my pistol go back into the holster and then I popped him one upside of his head. The way he acted, you'd think he'd really been arrested for perhaps a traffic ticket because he never had the usual symptoms of nervousness like uh, breaking out in a sweat or shaking or anything like that. He was just a real cool individual. And uh, you'd never think just by looking at him that uh, he was the one that was going to be accused of killing the president and Officer Tippett. Oswald, the enigmatic ex-Marine who briefly defected to Russia, and was working at the book depository on the day of the assassination, claimed he was in the second floor lunchroom at the time of the shooting. The first to interrogate him was Gus Rhodes. I looked up and I saw some officers bringing a man in who was handcuffed. And when I asked them what they had, one of the officers told me that they had the man here who had killed Officer Tippett. And uh, I took the handcuffs off of Oswald and asked him who he was. He refused to tell me, so I searched him. And in his pocket, he had a wallet, and in the wallet was two pieces of identification. Uh, one card said Lee Oswald, the other said Alex Heidel. When I asked him who that was, or which one of these he was, well, he became belligerent and something to the effect he said, you're the cop, you figure it out. 
I didn't shoot anybody, sir. I haven't been told what I'm here for. Do you have a lawyer? No, sir, I don't. The gun was fired one time by the suspect, but luckily it missed me. Fought with us like a wild man. And... Is there any doubt in your mind, Chief, that Oswald is the man who killed the president? I think this is the man that killed the president. From the moment of his arrest, Oswald was presumed guilty and portrayed to the world as a lone nut assassin. But he vehemently protested his innocence at every opportunity. Well, what, what the situation is about, nobody has told me anything except that I'm accused of, uh, of uh, murdering a policeman. I know nothing more than that, and I do request uh, for someone to come forward to give me uh, a legal assistance. Did you kill the president? No, I've not been charged with that. In fact, nobody has said that to me yet. Uh, the first thing I heard about it was when the newspaper reporters in the hall uh, asked me that question. You have been. Nobody said what? Sir? You have been. Nobody said what? Okay, man. Okay. Visibly shaken by this news, Oswald was to be interrogated for a further 36 hours. A policeman hit me. Before his transfer to the county jail. You regard the county jail as a more secure place to house the prisoner. Is that why you're transferring him from the city jail? It's customary after a man is filed on that he be transferred. We only keep him in our jail until he is filed on it. Necessary precautions will be taken, of course, but I don't think that the people will try to take the prisoner away from us. On the Sunday morning, Oswald was escorted through the basement of police headquarters by detectives Jim Lavelle and Elsie Graves. Jim Lavelle and myself and Oswald stepped off the elevator walked a few steps and waited till we got the all clear signal to go on out to the where the car was supposed to be parked waiting for us. But the car was not in place. Consequently, when I walked out, I was looking to my right where the car was being backed into position. But it wasn't quite wasn't where it ought to be. I could see this crowd of people to my left, which include police officers and news reporters, cameramen and so forth. I saw Ruby in this crowd to my left. He, he was standing on the front with a pistol in his hand down at his side. I caught him out of the corner of my eye. And then I started, of course, getting loose from Oswald where I could grab the gun. But before I could grab the gun, he had already gotten one shot off. So I grabbed his wrist and the gun simultaneously and just spun around with him. There is Leon. Yes. He's been shot. Shot rang up. Mass confusion. The man with a gun. Had uh, I not got that gun, he may, in the in the excitement, shot off some more rounds because he was still squeezing on that trigger in an attempt to shoot that pistol again. I think. Oswald really died just a short distance from the hospital because he stretched out every muscle in him tight and he just said, <clears throat> and then went totally limp. And as far as I know, he didn't make any move or sound after that. Mr. Oswald died at 107 our time in the operating room of the gunshot wound which he had received. By the Monday evening, both Oswald and Kennedy had been buried, and the inquest begun. All investigations focused on the lone gunman theory, and within two weeks, a detailed FBI report declared the guilt of Lee Harvey Oswald. Secret Service reenactments supported their conclusions. In March the following year, a sentence was passed on Jack Ruby. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder with malice as charged in the indictment and assess his punishment at death. Signed Meanwhile, the Warren Commission, charged by President Johnson to find the truth, operated almost entirely in secret. Based in Washington, the commissioners finally came to Dallas. Their spokesman was former CIA director Alan Dulles. Are you convinced that he was shot from the school book depository? Well, I think we better leave all that, you know, and I, not, the, uh, the evidence the report will cover all all of that, and we'll get into that, but uh, that question might lead to a lot more. And uh, Earl Warren, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, also came with Commissioner Gerald Ford, a future president. The prime purpose of their visit was to interview Jack Ruby, who had appealed against his sentence. A frightened man, he claimed he could not talk freely in Dallas and begged eight times to be taken to Washington to testify. 
The commissioners left, ignoring his pleas. Everything pertaining to what's happening has never come to the surface. The world will never know the true facts of what occurred, my motives. The people had, that had so much to gain and, and had such a material motive for putting me in a position I'm in will never let the true facts come above boards to the, to the world. Now, these people are in a very high position, yeah? Yes. The Warren report concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald, acting alone, killed President Kennedy. Incarcerated in his cell overlooking Dealey Plaza for another two and a half years, Jack Ruby suddenly contracted cancer and died at Parkland Hospital. With his silence permanently guaranteed, Ruby's body was flown to Chicago, the place of his birth, for burial. Only now, a quarter of a century after the President's death in Dallas, is the appalling truth behind his assassination and its cover-up revealed. Secretary Marilyn Sitzman, on the morning of the assassination, joined her boss, Abraham Zabruder, an enthusiastic home movie maker, on the grassy knoll. His film of the passing motorcade was to become the most detailed and gruesome record of the president's death. We were looking around to see where would be a good place to be. And he looked here and he said, well, this standing up here would be a good shot. But he said, I, I got vertical and I can't stand up there by myself. Would you stand behind me and hold on to me? I said, sure, why not? So he gets up here, I get up behind him, and I'm holding on to him. And he started filming about, oh, just before they came around the corner. And we're filming, they come around the corner and start coming down in there, you know, waving at everybody. And then we heard what to me sounded like two firecrackers. You know, it was, it was starting to get a little confusing because you could see things happening in the car. And you, you didn't quite get what was happening until they got right here in front of us in the third shot, hit Mr. Kennedy right in his head. We knew what happened. This harrowing footage, after examination by the FBI, was immediately purchased by the publisher's Time Life and locked away from public scrutiny. Were it not for photo analyst Robert Groden, who gained access to the original and worked on it secretly, its real significance may have remained hidden forever. We had been told that the president had been shot from behind, from the Texas School Book Depository. If that had happened, he would have been thrown forward, the transfer of momentum of the bullet striking him in the rear of the head. But what we saw was the exact opposite. When he was struck, he was thrown to the rear and to the left, indicating a shot from the grassy knoll. The knowledge that we had been lied to scared me. Yeah, I felt if anybody knew what I knew, that I'd be in a great deal of danger. So I didn't tell anybody. I quietly worked on the film for years. The more evidence that I was able to develop in the film, for instance, the timing of the shots, when the first shot was fired, uh, which was a lot earlier than the Warren Commission had told us, at a point when Oswald, had he been up in that window, could not have fired the shot until the most frightening, horrifying physical aspects, the nature of the wounds to the president's head, which are visible in some frames after the head shot, much clearer than anything the public has ever been allowed to see. Living with that became a horror, trying to keep that, afraid of being discovered that I knew that. That's, that's what frightened me the most. The Warren Commission ignored the film evidence of a shot from the front. They were also selective in their choice of eyewitness testimony. Two members of the Willis family told them of hearing shots fired from behind the president's car. However, other vital evidence they tried to offer went unrecorded. The implication was persuading, yes ma'am, because uh, all they wanted to know was three shots that, that probably came from the depository building, which I never have doubted. That's about all they wanted, that about all got into the one commission, really, that I heard three loud shots from a Texas depository. The headshot seemed to come from the right front. It seemed to strike him here, and uh, his head went back, and it, all of the brain matter went out the back of the head. It was like a red halo, a red circle with bright matter in the middle of it. It just went like that. It, it was a, a terrible time. You cannot imagine seeing this. You, you knew it happened, but... You didn't want to believe it. The particular headshot must have come from another direction besides behind him because the back of his head blew off and it doesn't make sense to be hit from the rear and still have your face intact. 
So he must have been hit from another position, you know, possibly, you know, in the front or over to the side. I, I really don't know where. But the back of his head blew off. So I am very dead certain at least one shot, including the one that took the president's skull off, had to come from the right front. And I'll stand by that to my death. Over my mother's grave. The doctors at Parkland Hospital, who tended the president minutes after the assassination, also saw a head wound compatible with a shot from the front. I can see that he had a large, uh, about seven centimeter opening in the right occipital parietal area. And considerable portion of the brain was missing there, and uh, the occipital cortex, the back portion of the brain, was lying down near the opening of the wound, and blood was trickling out. Almost a fifth or perhaps even a quarter of the right back part of the head in this area here had been blasted out along with probably most of the brain tissue in that area. The president's body was flown in Air Force One directly from Dallas to Washington. Accompanied by Jackie Kennedy, the ornamental bronze casket was unloaded at Andrews Air Force Base, apparently to be driven straight to the Naval Medical Center at Bethesda for the official autopsy. It was here that Commanders Humes and Boswell, with Colonel Fink, were making their preparations for the autopsy of the century. Assisting them was medical technician Paul O'Connor. The morgue door burst open and six or seven men came carrying this casket in and set it on the floor next to the uh, table, the autopsy table. As I remember, <clears throat> this casket was a type of casket that was a cheap shipping type of casket. What I mean by a shipping casket is that it's not a very ornamental casket. It's not very expensive. Uh, it's a very plain casket. This is not the casket in which Al Reich placed the president's body at Parkland Hospital, Dallas. It was a uh, expensive bronze color type. It was a bronze casket. Uh, one of the most expensive that we had in stock. Uh, it was a white satin lining inside the casket. Uh, we uh, wrapped him in one of the sheets and uh, just placed him in the casket. That way. The casket was opened, and inside was a slate gray rubber body bag with a zipper that ran from the head all the way down to the toes. It's, it's the kind of body bag that you find people that, that were carried out of a disaster in. They unzipped the body bag, and inside was the body of the president. We put the body on the table. There was he was he was nude, no, no clothes on, but he had a white sheet, bloody white sheet, on, wrapped around his face and his head. So between Parkland Hospital in Dallas and the autopsy in Washington, the president's body had mysteriously been placed in another casket and also wrapped differently. Since the autopsy, there's also been a major discrepancy in the description of the president's fatal head wound. It would be a jagged wound that involved the half of the right side of the back of the head. My initial impression was that it probably was an exit wound, so it was a very large wound. This is not what the official autopsy photographs show. Hidden away for a quarter of a century and shown here for the first time, they reveal the back of the head intact. The autopsy photographs show a massive wound, but it's in the right temporal area and into the parietal area, which is behind it, between the two. It is inconceivable to me that every single one of the witnesses who saw the president's head could be wrong, and specifically wrong, about this particular wound. They describe an avulsed, exploded, open wound in the rear of the head. In the autopsy photographs, you saw, see a small, neat wound of entrance. It's obvious to me that those photographs have been faked. When I first saw the pictures of the president's body, so-called wounds, what really struck me was 
especially the head wound, they showed a nice little neat round bullet hole in the back of his head. Well, actually what I saw was the whole side of his head blown off. It was gone. I don't know where those things came from, but they're totally wrong. Every one of them. In 1964, the Warren Commission dealt with this evidence by not looking at it. It was made available to them. They felt if they looked at it, they would have to deal with it and publish it. So they didn't deal with it. In 1977, around that time frame, the House Assassinations Committee had the photographs. What they did with it was even less excusable. They had the photographs, they had the questions that were brought to them about the photographs, and they did not allow the Dallas doctors, the most important witnesses in this particular area of the evidence, to even view them. And the reason seems quite clear. If they have the best eyewitnesses looking at the photographs saying that's not the condition of the president's head, then you not only have a conspiracy to kill the president, but absolute proof of the conspiracy to cover it up after the fact, because the only people who had the photographs were the government. If somebody faked those photographs, it was someone within the government, someone who had access to those photographs. But there are further disturbing indications of manipulation of the medical evidence in the hours prior to the autopsy of Bethesda. Dallas doctor Robert McClelland. I would estimate that about 20% to 25 percent of the entire brain was missing. My job in working with uh, autopsies was to remove the brain. What struck me was when we removed the sheet, I looked down and I said, my God, he didn't have any brains left, literally. That, I was just astounded by it. I think everybody else was too, but was, there was just a gasp throughout the room. There's no brain to be removed at all. At any normal autopsy involving such gunshot wounds, the brain would have been sectioned and the bullet tracks traced and all bullet fragments examined. This was not done. A vehement critic of the government's handling of the medical evidence is also one of the world's leading forensic pathologists, Dr. Cyril Wett. If the brain was not sectioned, then there could be no visualization of its interior. It's as if it never existed. I am very very suspicious and I do think that it could have been uh, the uh, the height of a sinister uh, conspiratorial activity in the post assassination cover-up in this case to uh, make sure that the brain was not examined in order to be able to disprove or at least to be able to withhold uh, the attempts by other people, me and other critics, to prove that there was a second gunman firing from the right side. Because again, you see, that gets to the question of whether or not there was a conspiracy. Another long-standing critic of the official version of events has pursued the truth through the Freedom of Information Act, acquiring valuable documents which he believes prove a cover-up at the highest level. Former Senate investigator Harold Weisberg Lee Harvey Oswald was killed by Jack Ruby on Sunday, the 24th of November. Nicholas Katzenbach was the acting attorney general and the deputy attorney general. And he knew immediately that Oswald wasn't going to be tried. They didn't have to put this evidence into court. So he takes a lawyer's le yellow Lego pad, and he writes out in longhand, a memorandum to Bill Moyers, that was the channel to Lyndon Johnson. And in essence, he says we got to convince the world that Oswald was a lone assassin and that the evidence was such that he would have been convicted if he'd gone to trial. This is before they collected any evidence. This was Monday morning, Monday after the assassination. The Dallas police were still collecting evidence and had to be stopped. After Oswald's death, the FBI swiftly requisitioned all the physical evidence, much to the chagrin of police chief Jesse Curry. I had a request, and I, I have it here where Mr. Wade requested uh, that I request that she turn all of the evidence obtained in the investigation of Lee Oswald's assassination of the president over to the FBI for mailing to Washington. We're turning all of our physical evidence over to the FBI. This was on the direct orders of the head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. Here you have the greatest police agency in the world. They're supposed to keep the president alive. He's killed in broad daylight on the streets of a modern American city. How can Hoover possibly admit that he couldn't know about this and he couldn't prevent it? There was only one way, by having a nut who was all alone to it. There was nobody to squeal on. So, from the beginning, J. Edgar Hoover had an instant vision. Oswald was a lone nut assassin, 
And that's all that anybody ever considered, anybody in official position. You can say, let me try and understand what the government did, how it worked this way. You can understand that maybe for a couple of days, they didn't want the truth to come out because they, they didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't want to frighten people. They wanted to preserve domestic tranquility. Was it going to be an attack on Lyndon Johnson or the Secretary of State? Was it going to be an invasion from abroad? Was this the beginning of a revolution? Those kind of things have to enter the thoughts of the people in, th in authority in Washington. After a couple of days when everybody knew this wasn't happening, then there's no excuse for the lie. The lie was that Oswald, a poor shot, fired his three bullets from the sixth floor window of the book depository in under seven seconds. No expert marksman has ever achieved this feat. The Warren Commission, basing its findings on the earlier FBI report, at first said two bullets had hit Kennedy, one in the back, one in the head, and one bullet had hit Governor Connolly. Their conclusions were thrown into disarray by eyewitness James Taig. I'm standing right at the east end of the triple underpass on the sidewalk between uh, Maine and Commerce. And when the first shot, which I thought was a firecracker, happened and I heard two more, I ducked behind the triple underpass and actually did not see too much of what was going on until I looked out and the presidential limousine was going right by me under the underpass. At that time, Deputy Sheriff Buddy Walters said, you have blood on your cheek. I reached up and there was a couple drops of blood. And at that time, I remembered something had stung me during the shooting. He says, where were you standing? We walked back and from about 40 feet away, we noticed a mark on the curb, a very fresh mark. The FBI sends some agents from Dallas and they file a report that says there's no mark there. It must have been eradicated by the brushes using to sweep the streets. You know, there'd be no streets left in the world if that happened, but it was accepted. But this wasn't even in the street, it was on the curbstone. So, of course, they couldn't get away with that. So the commission got after the FBI and they sent Lindall Shaneyfeld, a photographic expert, down. And accompanied by Robert Gemberling, who was the case agent in Dallas on the assassination, they went, they got the pictures, they spoke to the photographers, they went exactly to where a point was, and there it was. Except that it was a little bit different. Instead of a hole... You can see the difference in color, you can see the difference in texture, and I know because I've examined it at the archives. It's darker and smoother. Instead of a bullet hole or a nick made by a bullet, you've got it all smoothed over in darker color. So they, they dig it up, they take it back to Washington, they go through this incredible charade of making a spectro of scraping samples off and making a spectrographic analysis of what they know is not the evidence. They don't give a damn about the fact that underneath it is something that could have been a consequence if it hadn't been covered over. They have no questions about why would somebody want to hide this when the president is killed. And uh, then they destroyed the spectrographic plate when I asked for it. At least they say they did. And the court said they produce it. They said it doesn't exist. The explanation? Not under oath, understand. Just a possible explanation. It must have done it to save space. A 32nd of an inch. In the, in the world's largest collection of files, which the FBI has, they're saving space with one thirty-second of an inch, but they get away with this in court. They did not want a missed shot. It would not fit, and my testimony would prove that there was one missed shot that went over the limousine and hit the curb beside where I was standing. It did change the outcome of the Warren report. So late in the day, the commission were left with only two bullets to cause all the wounds to both Kennedy and Connolly. And one of those bullets had to have injured both men. To explain this, Arlen Specter, a counselor to the commission, created the single bullet theory, known to critics as the magic bullet. The infamous magic bullet. We have that bullet exiting from President Kennedy's neck, moving forward and leftward and downward, it now stops in midair, it turns to the right, it comes back a full 18 inches, stops again, and then slams into John Connolly's back. It continues downward, and it goes through his wrist, and somehow they get that right wrist over to the left thigh. If you look at the Zapruder film, you'll see in the individual frames that John Connolly's right wrist is not near John Connolly's left thigh. The significance of this, the importance cannot be exaggerated. It is impossible to overstate it. Why? Because the single bullet theory is the sine qua non of the Warren Commission report. It's not a matter of how much weight and credibility do you give to it. It's a matter 
of whether or not you have a single bullet theory that permits you to conclude that there was only one person firing, whether it was Oswald or anybody else in the world. If you don't have a single bullet theory, then you cannot have a sole assassin. And if you move to that point, then you're into conspiracy by definition. And that's why it had to stop with Oswald as a sole assassin. And that's why they came up with a single bullet theory. There's no question in my mind that that 26 volume set should be taken from the shelves of all the libraries where they now rest in the United States from nonfiction and placed in the fiction shelves along with Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn, and Gulliver's Travels. That's where they belong. Straight out of the realms of cheap fiction, Chicago's tough west side and the birthplace of a notorious son. Jack Ruby, small-time hoodlum and runner for Al Capone in the 30s, based his life around gambling, narcotics and prostitution. His carousel club in Dallas was one in a long line of unsuccessful nightclubs, where Ruby often played host to members of the Dallas police force and the criminal underworld. A fitness freak, Ruby swam in this pool at his apartment every morning, but internally his life was in chaos. In the months preceding the assassination, his phone calls from the carousel club and this apartment to well-connected mob figures increased ten and twentyfold, a pattern which had begun with the announcement in late April of President Kennedy's intended visit to Dallas. A distinguished journalist who knew Ruby well was Seth Cantor. In the weeks immediately before the assassination of the president, unaccountably, Ruby had visits from some members of the underworld who he had not even seen in a period of something like 20 years. In uh, May of 1963, uh, Ruby traveled to, uh, to New Orleans to negotiate for uh, one or more strippers for his club and dealt with a man named Harold Tenenbaum there. But New Orleans was and, uh, and has continued to be uh, controlled by uh, a very powerful mafia figure named Carlos Marcello. Marcello, a leading target of the Kennedy brothers' war on crime, had sworn vengeance against them. His interests in Bourbon Street were first visited by Ruby in June 1963, ostensibly to recruit fresh flesh for his carousel club. This dancer at the show bar, known as Jada, was signed up by Ruby. But was she the cover for more serious underworld business? Ruby's uh, connections with nightclub people in New Orleans meant that one way or another he was dealing with uh, Marcello Associates. He had uh, telephone contacts and personal contacts with various well-known gunmen and thugs who regularly uh, serviced the underworld in Chicago, Miami, Las Vegas, Houston, and in New Orleans. These underworld links were never investigated by the Warren Commission, who found no evidence of a conspiracy. They also found no connection between Ruby and Oswald. Interviewed for the first time, former nightclub singer Beverly Oliver has finally broken her silence of 25 years. I purposely have waited this long. I've always felt very threatened. You know, a lot of folks that uh, gave testimony are no longer around to give testimony any longer. I didn't want to become a statistic. I didn't want to be one of those people that shot myself in the back of the head with a shotgun. One night in particular, I recall about two weeks prior to the assassination, uh, being in the club, a uh, parking lot separated his club, the carousel, and the club that I worked at, the colony club. So in between shows, the showgirls from the colony club would go over to Jack's club and watch their show, and in their show breaks, they would come and watch our show. So I had trotted over there that night and, and was watching uh, the show. And uh, there was a girl that danced there by the name of Jada. And she was sitting at the table with Jack Ruby and another man. And I went and sat down with them to have a drink. As I sat down at the table, uh, Ruby introduced me to the man sitting there at the table with he and Jada. And he said, Beverly, this is my friend, Lee. And after Jack Ruby went into the police station and killed Lee Harvey Oswald. It was then that I realized this was the man that I had met in the club two weeks prior to the assassination of Kennedy. Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby were linked together, and I don't know how, and probably I never will.
but I know in my heart that man, Lee Harvey Oswald, or the person that was shot in the basement of the police station was the man that was in the club two weeks prior to the assassination. As a matter of fact, the next day, Jada gave an interview to the newspaper and she said the same thing that I'm saying to you now, that she met Oswald two weeks prior to the assassination of Kennedy. However, unfortunate it is, Jada is dead, or so they tell me. Jack Ruby's close links with the Dallas police gave him easy access to their headquarters. On the assassination weekend, he was seen there several times, even correcting information about Oswald given out at a press conference. Was he stalking his prey? Billy Grammer was a police communications officer on duty the night before Ruby killed Oswald. Around 9 p.m., he received an urgent message from a caller who refused to identify himself. I thought I recognized the voice, but at the same time, I could not put a, a face or a name with the voice. And uh, as we talked, he began telling me that uh, we needed to change the plans on moving Oswald from the basement, that uh, he knew of the plans to make the move, and if we did not make a change, he, the statement he made precisely was, we are going to kill him. Billy Grammer reported the call, finished his shift, and went home to bed. He was asleep when Ruby, seen here on the edge of picture in his gray fedora, 